For the past three decades, this event has brought the best and brightest literary voices to Tulsa and at the same time showcased all Tulsa has to offer to these esteemed visitors. Our normal home for this event is the Central Library downtown, which as you all know is currently a blank canvas. Uh, crews have finished selective demolition and work has begun on a very exciting renovation. It is scheduled to reopen in the first half of 2016. We are currently in the public phase of Tulsa Central Library Renewed, our capital campaign. Over the last year and a half, $29,990,000 have been raised and for this we owe thanks to the vision and leadership of campaign chairman Robert J. LaFortune. Unfortunately, Mr. LaFortune couldn't be here with us this evening, but as you all, he's probably raising money somewhere. He is just um, such a godsend to the library. Um, we also owe thanks and support to the individuals, foundations, and corporations, many of whom are represented here this evening. So thank you all very much for your contributions. Soon, Tulsa Central Library will once again be a state-of-the-art location for creativity, collaboration, and learning. There are still many opportunities to be recognized for donating to the project, so please feel free to send your check if you haven't already. This evening, we're happy to host this delightful dinner here at the Librarium, which showcases many of the features that you will soon find at the Central Library. Librarium is a working library as well as a library laboratory. I hope you will come back and visit during normal business hours. However, staff let me know that actually um, the self-check machines over there, which staff have named Kirk and Spock, and all the books, children's over there, and adult collections over there and behind, are all available for checkout if you brought your library card with you. So please avail yourself of them. Uh, Tonight's dinner is a friend raiser, allowing us to spend time with you, some of our favorite friends. We appreciate all of your support, all of you supporting the library and everything it represents. Friends like you help the library to change lives. Now I would like to introduce a library friend and volunteer, dinner chair, Kristen Bender. Mrs. Bender, if you would please come forward. So, Thank you, Kristen, for your very hard work and creativity in bringing this all together. Um, now I would like to give these to you. Thank you so much. I mean, it, uh, I mean, isn't this all very amazing? You guys, have, your team has done an amazing job. Now I would like to introduce the spirit and vision behind the Distinguished Author Series, Mrs. Peggy V. Helmerich. Mrs. Helmerich, would you please come forward? Okay, come here. If you could come here. So, first of all, words cannot express how much you and your family mean to the Tulsa City County Library and the Tulsa community. This dinner and the Distinguished Author Series is a true testament to your longstanding devotion to the library and our community. Mrs. Helmerich, we thank you and your family for your generosity and for nurturing the love of literature, literacy, and learning for all ages. For years, you have enabled Tulsa to honor the best contemporary authors from around the world. You will never know how much you mean to the library. I'm gonna give you a call. Okay, stay here. <laughs> Thank you. She is truly amazing, so please. <laughs> You're amazing. So, 
Thank you all. Um, I know she appreciates it very much. Um, but I want you to know that Mrs. Helmerich is highly involved in the author selection. She borrows authors' works from the library and attends, I know, at least one literary festival every year. So she is out scouring the country in search of great literary voices. And she attends every meeting. And I just want you guys to know all that, how involved she is with it. So I kind of feel like we're at the Academy Awards right now. <laughs> Except so ev everybody knows who, who the winner is. Um, and speaking of winners, it's an exciting treat for us to gather tonight to spend time getting to know critically acclaimed novelist Anne Patchett. As a favor for each couple, we have a signed copy of Miss Patchett's Penn Faulkner award-winning novel, Bel, Bel Canto. Um, uh, if you would indulge me, though, I'd like to read a few lines from the publisher's description of the novel. Um, so it starts. Somewhere in South America, at the home of the country's vice president, a lavish birthday party is being held in honor of the powerful businessman, Mr. Hosokawa. Roxanne Koss, opera's most revered soprano, has mesmerized the international guests with her singing. It is a perfect evening. Mrs. Helmrich, I understand you have arranged for a special treat for us um, for this very perfect evening. So I was wondering if you could tell folks about that. Well, as you know, the book you see in front of you, Bel Canto, is a beautifully written and thrilling book. And the heart of the book happens to be a beautiful, internationally acclaimed, world-renowned opera singer. I knew I wasn't going to do this, it's but right I'm going to do it. That's right, sir. Okay. In honor of Ann Patchett and all of you, our customers, our attend, our friends. <laughs> Do you realize that you've been supporting us as loyal friends for 29 years? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And this next offering was to be a surprise for Ann Patchett, but she is so nosy. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot keep anything from her, <laughs> not even the surprise. <laughs> it is such a great pleasure for me to introduce my good friend and also one of the most internationally acclaimed, world-famous opera singers who is from our hometown, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it is such a pleasure for me to present to you now, Sarah Coburn.
Now that is a tough act to follow. Man, wonderful. Another hand for her. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2014 Peggy V. Helmerich Award presentation. Tonight you'll meet another distinguished author in the Helmerich tradition of recognizing literary ex exceptionalism. Anne Pageant is a writer of imaginative fiction with six widely acclaimed novels. She is also acknowledged for her nonfiction, including an award-winning memoir and a series of essays exploring her determination to become a writer. Life experience is a key ingredient in every writer's work, so here are a few of the milestones in Anne Pageant's life. She was born in Los Angeles, moved to Nashville at age six, and it's still her hometown today. Her mother was a registered nurse for 40 years, and at age 60, wrote her first novel. Today, Jeannie Ray is a best-selling New York Times author, also living in Nashville, right down the street. Anne's father was a captain with the Los Angeles Police Department. Her husband, Carl, is a physician. She attended high school at St. Bernard's Academy, a Catholic school for girls. Her first work was published in the Paris Review when she was 21 years old. And she wrote it when she was a 19-year-old sophomore at Sarah Lawrence College where she received her BA degree. She also holds a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Iowa. At one time, she considered a career in law, law enforcement. This will be hard for you to believe when you when she's up here, and she actually qualified for the Los Angeles uh, Police Department Academy. <laughs> she has had stints as a waitress, a cook, an editor, and a college professor. Anne has a deep love for dogs. Sparky, an adopted shelter dog, is her guaranteed source of pleasure. Nashville's wonderful parks are what she likes best about her hometown. Something I enjoyed is she's an entrepreneur. When Nashville lacked a top-notch bookstore, she opened Parnassus Books and still runs it today. And John o. Helmerich and I had a chance to visit Parnassus Books, and sure enough, Ann Padgett was there. She's a loyal friend. Her lifelong friendship with her college roommate, Lucy Creeley, is tenderly recalled in her memoir, Truth and Beauty. Most of her works have received some form of notable literary recognition. Let me just relate a few, because they're quite a quite a few. The Magician's Assistant won the Tennessee Writers Award. It was shortlisted for the United Kingdom Orange Prize, which is given annually for the best full-length novel written in English by a woman of any nationality. Patron Saint of Liars was the New York Times notable book in 1992 and won the James A. Michener Copernicus Award. Taft was awarded the Janet Heidinger Kafka Prize for the best work of fiction in 1994. Bel Canto, which you have on your table, 
won both the Penn Faulkner Award and the United Kingdom's Orange Prize. It was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and was named Book Sense Book of the Year. Truth and Beauty, which I mentioned a moment ago, a nonfiction memoir, was one of the best books of the year. It was named one of the best books of the year by the Chicago Tribune, the San Francisco Chronicle, Entertainment Weekly. It was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. It won the Chicago Tribune's Heartland Prize and the Harold E. Versal Memorial Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and it also won the Alex Award from the American Library Association. Imaginative and unconventional are the words widely used to describe Ann Paget's work. But she says simply, imagination is the one time in life that you can go anywhere. And indeed, she has gone far. In 2012, Time Magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world. But tonight, we're here to celebrate her lifetime literary achievements. When asked to advise an aspiring author, she simply said, read. Read everything you can get your hands on and try to figure out how the author made you feel a certain way. And I would have to tell you that your interests certainly mirror those of the Tulsa community. We're proud of our parks. We've got a lot of beautiful parks and we've got more coming. We love our dogs. <laughs> and as tonight's turnout indicates, we value reading. It's the medium which has allowed you to transfer to us the wonders of your imagination. And those literary wonders are the reason you're the 2014 Peggy V. Helmerick Award winner. Please come up here. Now you get, you get two awards. This is the uh, crystal book. That's very nice. Something for your table. I like that. And here's something you'll probably like even more. You know. The check. <laughs> they trusted me with it. But that's, yeah. that's, oh, yes. Yes. Okay. You don't want to see the check, do you? <laughs> I think it's in there. I didn't look. Here, Jenny, I'll give these to you. Tulsa. Ah. Okay, let me start by saying this has been such an incredibly happy time. I love this city and this library, this funny, funky Safeway of a library. <laughs> I, I think is amazing. The people who have put on this show, the people that I have come to know since I got in here at five o'clock last night, Ken and Gary and Larry, and especially Kristen, who's been so great to me. Peggy, you know there is equality, and all of you know this already because you know Peggy. There are very few people in the world who are so completely themselves at every moment that you can know them for a few hours and feel like they're your best friend. My feelings for you are so inappropriate. <laughs> and um, I would give the check and the little crystal thing back if I could just keep you. So it's really, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the reasons that I am speaking with a handheld mic is because I, I want you to see my dress, which is, which is so fabulous. And so many people have come up to me tonight and said, tell me about your dress. So first, I'm going to tell you about my dress. Uh, this dress was a gift from my friend Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And Liz has been on an eight-week tour across America with Oprah. Oprah has been doing this sort of stadium event thing all across the country. And Liz has gone with Oprah for eight different stadium events. And because she is Liz, she bought eight different Oscar de la Renta dresses to wear at the eight different events. And one of them showed up and was too small. And she said she realized she would have to have her ribs surgically removed. And uh, so she sent it to me. So that's the story of the dress. Thank you. Thank, um, and, and thank Liz, I'm, I'm getting a lot of miles out of it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight. I'm going to see if I can see that clock, but I really can't, so I, I'll figure it out. I'm going to talk about altruism 
uh, which is something that I have been thinking about a lot in my life. And I bet a lot of you think about this as well. You know, the good deeds. We're going to do a good deed. And I started thinking about this not too long ago when a friend of mine, a writer named Madison Smart Bell, emailed me. And he said he wanted to ask me a question about altruism. He said, do you think that there really is such a thing as altruism? Is there really such a thing as a good deed? Or is it that the people who do the good deed get their pleasure out of doing good deeds, and therefore it isn't really a good deed because it's the thing that gives them pleasure? So if Mother Teresa really enjoyed helping lepers, then that really wouldn't be any different from a teenage girl who really, really enjoyed shopping at the Gap. Uh, because, you know, she was just kind of going into her own pleasure zone. And I said, absolutely not. Uh, well, Madison Smart Bell had been reading a lot of Christopher Hitchens, which I think is how he got there. But he, I said, no, that's, that's absolutely not the case. A good deed is a good deed, regardless of whether or not you get some benefit from it. And frankly, if you give a blanket to somebody who's cold, all that matters is that they were cold and they have a blanket. And if you have gained some sort of personal enjoyment for that, you know, all the better in my book. People ask me these questions. When writers have these sort of moral questions, they usually call me because I went to Catholic girls' school for 12 years. So I kept thinking about this whole altruism thing, and I called my nun. I actually, I have my own nun. I highly recommend this. Uh, Sister Nina is 82, and when I say she's mine, she is mine. She is my responsibility in this world. I am her patron. Uh, it's a, it is a very Catholic, old-fashioned Catholic arrangement. I take care of her, and in return, she prays for me, and I get things like better parking spaces. Um, and so I called Nina, and I said, and she also taught me to read, as she likes to point out. She was my reading teacher from first through third grade, and I was very slow to learn how to read, and she kept me in from recess for three years and bullied me, and I hated her when I was a kid, but we met again later in life and fell in love. So I called her and I said, you know, what do you think about this whole altruism thing? You know, is it, is it wrong if you feel like you're getting some sort of jolly out of doing a good deed? If it makes you feel all shiny and happy, then it is, is it actually a good deed? And she said, absolutely, it's a good deed. Don't listen to this guy. That's ridiculous. You should always feel good about doing a good deed. So this is my good deed. Um, and this is kind of how my life has changed. I used to be what I referred to as an inside person, which is I, I was a novelist, I was a writer, and I did everything I could to stay inside and to keep my life as simple and as quiet as possible because that's the best place for me from which to work. Uh, I, don't use, I don't use a cell phone. I've never used any form of social media. I've never texted. I don't watch television ever. I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly careful with my brain. I really believe that my brain is this sort of very quiet, still thing, and I'm very good at focusing on one thing for long periods of time. I, I'm not capable of multitasking. I actually believe that none of you are capable of multitasking either. I really think that that's kind of not how we're designed. Kristen, don't, don't ever text and drive. Okay, just want to say that. Um, so, anyway, <laughs> not just once, just... It was a really hard day. Okay, okay. So, um, so I'm very quiet, and I kind of keep myself in a very quiet place, and that is the place from which I write fiction. But something happened in my hometown of Nashville. Uh, it's been a little over three and a half years ago now, which is we had two bookstores in Nashville. They were both 30,000 square feet, one of which was a Borders, we all know what happened to Borders. The whole chain went under. Borders, you guys had a Borders here, didn't you? Borders was a terrific store. Borders had hideous management. I mean, they really, they were thriving, they were making money, and the management of that store at the upper level just destroyed it. So we had a 30,000 square foot Borders in Nashville, and it closed when all the Borders closed. We also had another store called Davis Kid. And Davis Kid, when I was growing up, had been our locally owned and operated independent bookstore. It was bought 10 years ago by a chain out of Ohio called Joseph Beth. 
Joseph Beth moved it into the mall, also into a 30,000 square foot face, space, which is now a container store. Uh, if you just want to know what happens, like Safeways become libraries, bookstores become container stores. And they had 10 stores and they, they were way overextended. They closed eight of them and one of them was the Nashville store. So this is, this is where we are at. We had 60,000 square feet of retail space. And those square feet were profitable in Nashville every month they were in business. That's a very interesting thing. So we have two giant bookstores in Nashville, 30,000 square feet, and they're paying their rent and they're paying their employees and they're profitable every month. So when they were closed, it really wasn't Nashville's fault. And Nashville took it very hard. You know, they believed it was their fault. They believed that because they had read a book on their Kindle, because they had ordered something from Amazon, you know, they, we lost our bookstore. And the thing that happens, as you all know, is that we lose things now in our communities. When we lose our independent drugstore, do you guys have an independent pharmacy anymore? Oh, good for you. Uh, we've lost all of ours in Nashville. We're all Walgreens now. When you lose your independent hardware store, your record store, your liquor store, you know, whatever it is, it's not a chain, that you know the people who own these businesses, those things don't ever come back. So Nashville, you know, hemmed and hawed and beat their breasts and had committee meetings and we got to get a bookstore back. And I kept waiting, right? Because I'm a writer, it's very important to me that there's a bookstore in the city where I live. And I waited and I waited and I thought to myself, whose responsibility is it to open a bookstore? That's a very bad sentence for me. Because I went to Catholic school for 12 years and the nuns, especially Sister Nina, always used to say, if you can formulate the sentence in your mind, whose responsibility is it to, whose responsibility is it to fund the library you're building in Tulsa? Whose responsibility is it to reform public education in this country? Whose responsibility is it to pick up that trash on the side of the road? Well, you know what? It's yours. That's the way it works. As soon as you can wonder, you're aware enough of what's going on that you can wonder, this is what they teach you in Catholic girls' school, whose responsibility is it? Then it's yours. So this was a very dark moment because I wanted to go into retail about as much as I wanted to go into the Marines. Um, this was not my dream. I did not sit around and think, oh, someday I hope I own a bookstore. Uh, but I also didn't want to live in a city that didn't have a bookstore. So I was introduced to a woman named Karen Hayes. And Karen Hayes and I, over the course of one lunch, decided that we were gonna go into business together. And our partnership was gonna be a 50-50 partnership in which we divided it accordingly. I would pay for everything and she did all of the work. I'm gonna backtrack, and that's actually what we do and it's worked out brilliantly. Uh, I'm gonna backtrack for just a second and, and tell you a story about a moment that really changed my entire life. And it happened when I was in college. I, uh, when I was in college, I went to Harvard Summer School one summer. And Harvard, as I'm sure you know, is a, is a very important and venerable American institution of education. But what you might not know unless you went there yourself is they have a cockroach problem that you can't even get your head around. They've got, they've got bugs at, at Harvard going back to the 1800s. And um, you, know, you know who their great grandparents were. And, and they're big and they're strong and they're better than you in every way. So one summer in between my freshman and junior year of college, sophomore and junior year of college, I was at Harvard and I was in a suite with three other girls and we had a lot of cockroaches. And they, they were awful, they, you know, they terrorized us. We would flick on the lights, they would run around, we would scream, we would run from them and the cockroaches would just laugh. You know, they didn't, they didn't even try to hide. So one night I was reading in bed, it was about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, and I got out of bed, lights were on, and I stepped on a bug that was, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And I didn't hurt it at all. <laughs> like I didn't even sprain one of its ankles. 
It's many, many ankles. Uh, and I screamed and I was crying and my roommates came out and we were screaming and we were chasing the bug around and we were running around and we finally got it into the bathroom and we rolled up a towel and we shoved it under the door and we were like, ah, ah, and I said, I'll go get security. <laughs> so I went outside and I found a security guard, he was like 90, and I, I was like, ah, in our room, there was a bug. You have to come and kill it. And he was like, okay, all right, I'll come up. So he comes up and we're all crying and we're doing that things that, that girls do when they're 19 and they're really upset. We were hopping. <laughs> we're all hopping while we were crying. And we opened the bathroom door and the cockroach is in the shower. And I said, there, it's there. And, and I'm not making this up. And this was the moment, honest to God, this was the moment that changed my life. So the security guard walks in and he looks in the shower and he looks at the bug and he looks at the four of us screaming, hopping. And he says, ladies, you are on your own. <laughs> and he left. And you know what? He was right. We are on our own. We are on our own. And I look back at these three girls who I knew and I knew it wasn't gonna be them. It was gonna be me. And I knew it was always gonna be me. And I took my shoe off and I did what needed to be done. And, and that's what it was like opening a bookstore. And I did it so fast. I met Karen in April of 2011. And we opened Parnassus Books on November 16th of 2011. I, we went from being strangers who were like, man, there really should be a bookstore in this city, to opening a bookstore. The reason that we finally opened when we didn't have, say, light fixtures in the store, we didn't have any idea what we were doing, is that I had given so many interviews. I had this theory, build it and they will come. If I just keep talking about it, it will happen. When I was in my 20s, I used to write for fashion magazines and into my 30s as well. And the worst magazine to write for was Elle because Elle always wanted to identify trends. I was living in Montana at the time. They wanted me to identify fashion trends in Paris while living in Missoula, Montana. And they wanted it four months in advance. And I finally came to the great conclusion that everybody who writes for fashion magazines comes to which is a trend is whatever you call a trend. So I started giving all of these interviews, all, I mean truly, all over the world I was giving interviews because people were calling me saying, you're mad, you're out of your mind. You can't open a bookstore, books are dead. Bookstores are dead. There's not even gonna be such a thing as a book in two years. Everybody said that, I have no idea what that means. Like they're gonna round them all up like a Ray Bradbury novel and torch them or something. And I said, well, this is the way it works. I'm part of a trend. I said, you know, there was a little independent bookstore, a little mom and pop bookstore, and it did well. Because it did well, it expanded, it grew bigger, and it got other stores. And Barnes and Noble looked down on the trend of the little bookstore doing better. They said, there's real money to be made here, so we're gonna get into the book selling business. And the superstore rose up and it crushed the little mom and pop independent stores. And then Barnes and Noble and Borders did so well that Amazon looked down and said, you know what, we can wipe these people out. We can do all of this on the internet, not have a brick and mortar store anymore. And so Amazon rose up and it killed the superstores. And at some point, somebody looked up and said, wow, I really miss being able to go to a little mom and pop bookstore where people knew me and they cared about what I was reading and now the little bookstore rises up like the phoenix from the ashes. I just kept saying this over and over and over and over again. And one day I picked up the New York Times and there on page one was a photograph of me announcing the opening of my bookstore that day. I called Karen, I was like, guess what? Guess we're opening today, light or no light. Why? Because we're on the front page of the New York Times. That's really interesting. What would an author have to do to get on the front page of the New York Times? What would a 
What would a literary author have to do to get on the front page of the New York Times? I'd have to like shoot Oprah. I would have to, I would have to kill Jonathan Franzen. I would have to do something so outrageous. I mean, and even that, they'd probably put me on page four. I opened a 3,000 square foot bookstore in a strip mall behind the donut den next to Sherwin-Williams paint. And it was such a big, in Nashville, Tennessee, it was such a big deal that they put me on the front page of the Times. Why is that? Maybe because we're all getting tired of the bad news, which is books are dead, no one's reading, no one ever reads, dead, dead, libraries are dead, bookstores are dead. It's, and here I am going, you know what? It's not true. It's not true. We are all rising again from the ashes. People are reading, people are buying books. I went through this very weird time then of what I call secondary publicity. So when the bookstore opens, we've got the Times, I'm in People Magazine, I'm on NPR so often, they call it National Patchet Radio. And then I started getting this sort of second wave of publicity. So I, I stopped being a writer and I started being a famous retailer. I was on the Colbert Report because I was a famous retailer. They actually had no idea that I was a novelist. They invited me on because I own a bookstore next to a Sherwin-Williams paint store. And then I went on to this whole thing of, you know, being famous. Time 100? Did they give that to me because I was a good writer? No, they gave it to me because I had the bookstore next to the donut den. Um, because it's good news, because everybody really, in our hearts, we really do want to believe in reading and in literature, and I became the person who was standing up for those things. And I thought that I was being incredibly altruistic. I thought that I was giving a gift to my city, even though I'm actually a really smart business person, uh, which is weird for a novelist. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out if you have 60,000 square feet of retail space in the city and you're boiling that down to 3,000 square feet, you're actually going to get a lot of customers and you're going to do fine. And everything turned out to be great. And it turns out that yes, I did give a super gift to my city and now when people stop me in the grocery store, they stop me to say thank you for the bookstore, we bring my kids there, Oh, man, I was in the frozen food section of Publix one day, and this woman comes up to me and she says, my, I would really like my kids to be able to meet you. And she brings her three little kids over. This is the lady who owns Parnassus Books. And it was like these kids were meeting Santa Claus in the frozen food section. That is a beautiful thing. So if I had had the wherewithal to imagine that moment, I wouldn't have thought that what I was doing was altruistic. My dog Sparky works at the bookstore a whole lot more than I do. I get curb service if I'm in a hurry. I call the bookstore, I pull up front, I roll the window down, somebody comes out, pulls him out of the car, just puts him in the store. He runs around all day, he meets the customers, he has the best time in the world. I would have built that store for Sparky. We hire all of these people, it's like a sitcom. It's like I own Cheers now. All of these people who are so smart and interesting and really strange. And I go to the back one day and the, and the staff is standing around and they're fighting. And I say, what's going on? What are you guys arguing about? They're arguing about which Evelyn Waugh novel is their favorite. And I just thought, God love you, where else could you go? Where, where could you go and wear your pajama bottoms and flip-flops and argue about which Evil and Wah novel you love the best? I mean, I would, have, I would have opened a bookstore just so they had some place to go. But the very best thing about opening a bookstore and the thing that if I had ever thought of this, I would have opened a bookstore when I was 17 we all are readers. I'm assuming you're not just here because somebody forced you to be here. I'm, I'm assuming you're here because you read and you care about literature and about literacy and it's part of your life. So you know that if you read a book and you love, love a book, fall in love with a book the way you fall in love with a person, 
That experience of loving a book is not complete until you can turn around and say to somebody, you have to read this book. You and this book are going to be beshared. You are going to be soulmates, you and this book. And that's what it is to really, really love a book. And I love books. And I've been doing this my whole life to my family and to my friends. I've been making them read the books that I love. Now I own a store full of strangers, people I've never seen. And I can just walk up to any of them and say, hey, you need to read Karen Joy Fowler's We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves. Did you not read Jim McBride's The Good Lord Bird? Oh, you've got to read Phil Clay's Redeployment. Seriously, guys, you've got to read Phil Clay's Redeployment. It just won the National Book Award. I can do this all day long. I am a matchmaker. I can connect people with the books that will change their lives. Another story. Graduate school, University of Iowa. I was flying through O'Hare. This would have been 1986, give or take. You remember O'Hare in 1986? You could get lost, you know? It was huge and it was confusing. You can't get lost in an airport anymore at all. Your ticket only takes you to exactly where you have to go. In 1986, um, I could get lost in O'Hare. And I was standing there looking at my ticket and I was looking at the signs and this guy came up to me and he was really cute. He looked like John Denver. He had on a pink polo shirt uh, not a polo shirt, an Oxford shirt, and khaki pants, and he had straight blonde hair and little round glasses. And he said, are you lost? And I said, yeah, I am. He said, let me see your ticket. And I gave him my ticket, and he looked at it. He said, wow, you are really, really far away from where you need to go. He said, I've got time. He said, I'll walk you to your gate. I was like, really? Wow, okay, that's nice. You're really cute. I, okay. Um, so, and he said, I'll take your bag. So he took my bag, which was heavy, and he's walking me to the gate. And I said, this is so nice of you, cute boy who looks like John Denver. Um, I said, why do you have all this extra time? Is your plane late? And he said, no, I work here. I'm a Hare Krishna. <laughs> do you remember 1986? Do you remember when we used to be afraid of Hare Krishnas? Do you remember what a beautiful world this was when the scariest thing in the airport was a Hare Krishna? <laughs> And I was terrified. I went to Catholic school for 12 years. I was like, oh my God, you're going to make me wear orange and I don't look good in orange and you're going to make me play a tambourine and you're going to make me eat kale or something. I was, and I was like, he's got my bag, he's got my bag. I don't know how I'm going to get away from him. I was so afraid of the Hare Krishna. So we get to my gate and I'm all kind of trembly and my flight's been delayed for two hours. And he says, I'll wait with you. <laughs> and okay, it turns out that the Hare Krishna was the nicest guy in the world. And he said this to me. He said, imagine that you love God so much that you would be willing to stand in an airport and tell people, because this is the greatest thing in the world. This is the greatest love, the greatest joy in the world. It is so huge and important that you would be willing to stand in an airport where people are rushing by you and they hate you and they're afraid of you and it doesn't even matter because you love God so much you want to tell people about it. And that's how I feel about books. That's what it's like for me to stand in my bookstore and say, you have got to read this book. It is the most fantastic joy because reading has truly been the great love of my life. And the older I get, the more important it is, the more I love it, the more, it's like everything I'm looking for, I am finding in books. And the fact that I can connect people to the books that I feel will change their lives in the way that books have changed my lives, my life, that's singular, uh, that is really joy. 
and there could be no altruism whatsoever involved in that. So I stumbled into this thing blindly, and this is what I wound up with. Not only do I have a bookstore, which is, by the way, a thriving, successful business, and we are shooting the lights out, and I'm getting to provide a home for some people who wouldn't have a, another place to work because they'd have to actually get dressed, and I'm providing a fun, safe environment for my dog, and I'm getting to recommend books. The other part of it is, quite unwittingly, I have become the spokesperson for independent book selling in this country. And I now go all over and I get to explain something to you that other booksellers can't explain because it looks like they're being too mercenary, which is this. It is fine with me if you read electronically. I care that you read, I don't care how you read. It's fine with me if you order off of Amazon. But what is never, never fine for me or for anyone else is for you to go into my bookstore or anybody else's bookstore and talk to the smart staff and pick up the books and sniff the pages and look at the jacket art and read the flap copy and go home and order it off of Amazon for $4 less. Because if you do that, I'll find you. <laughs> I'll come to your house. Um, I grew up in the South, and when I was growing up, I believed that Walmart killed small town America. I believed when I was a kid that Walmart came in and destroyed little towns. My cousins lived in Carthage, Tennessee. One of my cousins owned the pharmacy there. And uh, he went out of business. Everything in the town square went out of business. Oh, Walmart, I thought. All my life, Walmart. Oh, so bad, so terrible. It wasn't until I opened a retail establishment, until I opened a small business, that for the first time I realized Walmart did nothing wrong. Walmart did nothing wrong. We did it. And we did it because we decided that we wanted to save 17 cents a bag on cotton balls at Walmart instead of buying them from our neighbor who owned the pharmacy, who'd always owned the pharmacy. And we make the decisions about what happens in our community and in our lives. I go around and I talk about this stuff. I met a woman once who ran a gardening store, a little tiny gardening store. She said, people come in and they spend an hour with me and they say, when do I put these plants in? What goes in in the sun? What goes in in the shade? What fertilizer do I use? What pesticides do I use? Thanks very much, I'm gonna go to Home Depot now and get my plants. They'll actually say that. And I think people aren't bad, but people are stupid. And, and that for some reason, I have no idea why, it has become my job to remind people that if you have something in your community, if you have something in your life, that you value, then it's up to you to take care of it. And if you wonder whose responsibility it is, it's your responsibility. I have met so many wonderful people in this city who have come up to me and said, we need an independent bookstore in Tulsa, and I am here to tell you, you can absolutely do it. This is such an astonishing city. If you care about your bookstore, support your bookstore. It'll work. If you care about your library, support your library. Libraries, and you all know this, have become the sort of moral red cross of our nation. It's where we go to have community. It's where we go when we don't have a job and we need to fill up our days. It's where we go when we want to learn to speak better English. We want to have something for our children. We want to have story time. We want to have computers so we can apply for jobs that we might not be able to get otherwise. If you're somebody who doesn't have to do these things, then you, by being here tonight, are remembering and honoring people in our community. I mean, truly, the people who are our community and our family to make sure that they can have the same beautiful life that we have. Books books for free, books for sale, books for everyone, books forever. I am so honored to be here. This has been a
beautiful event. Thank you, Tulsa. Thank you, Peggy, for having me. Good night. I have never had more people worry about me getting up here. And I, I'm just going to tell you a few things before you leave. But do you really want to go out into that parking lot stuff? And um, I'm on. I promise not to embarrass you. Lewis Meyer. That's the only other thing I wanted to say. To Lewis Meyer. I. I Somebody's got to tell you about Lewis Meyer. He, he had your enthusiasm. He had, he loved books so much. He would lock arms and take you to the, it, that, that was a wonderful memory. Um, anyway, um, okay. I'm, I'm going to stick to this, Gary, I promise. Uh, magic. I'm a grandfather. My, my grandchildren, I love them to death. And you know what that makes you. And you take a pumpkin and you, it turns into a chariot, or you take a, a group of mice and you turn them into steeds that pull this wonderful coach or chariot, and uh, you take a Safeway, <laughs> and, and you, you create this incredible black tie event, complete with operatic beauty, and, uh, and then you add the magic and pageant. So, absolutely. And now the important stuff. Um, I represent the, the board of the Library Trust, and I just wanted to briefly thank Steve Austin for his incredible leadership and his uh, guidance up until now, because he's still the president of the uh, Library Trust, and he should be up here instead of me. But uh, anyway, Steve, you've done a fantastic job in this transition. I, I think I ought to give him a... He's a tough act to follow, too. Uh, okay, so the important stuff. Uh, please remember, remind everybody that tomorrow is the public presentation uh, at 1030 at the Hardesty Regional Library, where Ms. Padgett will be there one more time. The Cherokee Nation will be included in the Library Hall of Fame uh, Saturday morning. You know and um, I've got to be careful about this because the ladies, please take the small bouquet of flowers in your table, do not take the, the glass. <clears throat> you will be stopped at the door if you do. And, and with that I say thank you and good evening. <laughs>